All right, so now we'll begin our online lecture on phonology. You'll remember that I warned you, having already taken phonetics is both a blessing and a curse. On the one hand, you'll know a lot of the basics of uh, IPA, of pronunciation. You'll know articulatory phonetics. So you'll understand the symbols and you won't have to learn those. But on the other hand, you'll have to think about them uh, in a slightly different way. And you'll have to break away from some of that phonetic way of thinking, especially now that we move on to phonology. A phoneme is represented in forward slashes. I know before that you thought of that as just broad transcription. Erase that from your mind. The forward slashes do not represent actual sounds in the world. Instead, the forward slashes represent a mental reality. That's why I have them in the thought bubble here. That's what your mind thinks of as these various sounds. Now, in reality, you know from articulatory phonetics that those sounds are actually quite different. You have an aspirated T, as in something like top. You have an unaspirated T, as I might pro uh, produce it in something like what. You have a flap that we might see in something like water. Or you have uh, the glottal stop, which you might see in something like ba um I don't know, some pronunciations of uh, English words, um, for, for instance, in British uh, English, um, something like, um, or even in, in, in American English, something like button, button, which is actually the stop there is just a glottal stop. But regardless of which phone you actually produce, which uh, sound actually gets made in the world, English speakers categorize all those sounds as instances of this one mental category, which we're going to call the, the T. Now remember, that mental category doesn't actually have a sound, because it could be the aspirated T, it could be the unaspirated T, or the unreleased T, it could be uh, the flap, or it could be the glottal stop. We have all of these options of ways that this mental um, idea is pronounced. So this is why I have the mental idea in the thought bubble and all of the actual um, possible pronunciations, the possible phones that you can say in speech bubbles. Because the speech bubbles tell us what we actually say, whereas this here it could be any of those. It doesn't have any particular sound. This is why phonetics was so difficult when you first learned, whether you learned it last chapter or you learned it last semester, because you heard T. You didn't hear, you, you, however that sounds, you didn't hear the flap. You didn't hear the glottal stop. You just heard the sound T. And that's exactly what should happen to, to a native English speaker. A native English speaker should categorize all these different sounds as instances of this one sound. So we will call all of the different sounds that can be the actual physical manifestations of the mental category, we will call these the allophones. The mental categories are called phonemes. So what we can say is that the phoneme T is realized as an aspirated T, an unaspirated T, um, a, a voiced alveolar flap, or a, a voiceless glottal stop. So those are four possible realizations of the phoneme T. And just so you have it, let's look at another uh, example of this. Uh, we have here um, the phoneme T. N. And again, how is this phoneme pronounced? It's not. It's a mental category. That's why we have it in the forward slashes. But that mental category gets produced as all of these different sounds. So even though we have the sound, um, uh, we have the N sound, which is pronounced N often in something like, um, I don't know, the word nose, we can also have uh, other options. So if we have the N followed by a P sound, for instance, if I wanted to say, I come in peace, we, what we actually say is, I come M peace, I come in peace. And we don't actually say, I come in peace. In rapid speech, we say, I come in peace. But we hear that that M sound as if it were an N, because the M sound is one possible realization of the N phoneme. So you can have the actual uh, realization as the N, right, the alveolar nasal, uh, or you can have it as an M, the bilabial nasal. You can even have it uh, as a, a velar nasal, as a N. So if you have the 
N phoneme in your mind, followed by a K, for instance, then you might have in keeping uh, with the aforementioned idea, in keeping. So I don't say in keeping, but rather I say in keeping. So what happens is the mental idea of the N actually gets produced as a N sound. And so we can have all of this. We can also have uh, instances uh, where we see. We also see some instances where the N phoneme is actually produced dentally. So what we have as the allophone there is actually um, a slightly interdental nasal. And so what we so this is a dentalized nasal. So if I wanted to say something like uh, if you had the N phoneme followed by an interdental fricative like th, then something like in theory, when I say N, I don't actually produce it as an alveolar N, but rather interdentally. So I'll say in theory. And so you have sl a slight dentalization of the N. These are all possible uh, realizations. These are all possible things the mouth could do to produce the phones. So these are allophones of the mental category N. So your brain hears all of these as if they're, they're instances of the same sound, even though actually they're quite different sounds. And in fact, in different languages, these can be categorized quite differently. So we see here in Korean, for instance, that we have these uh, phonemes um, that can be realized as different allophones. So the, the P with aspiration, right, P, the T with aspiration, T, the K with aspiration, K, is a different phoneme than the P without aspiration, the T without aspiration, and the K without aspiration. They actually are, Korean speakers actually think of them as different sounds. Whereas over here in English we see that we think of PT and K as all phonemes that can be realized either aspirated or unaspirated. We hear them as the same sound. If you're not trained, you wouldn't realize that those are, are, um, are actually different sounds because your brain automatically puts the aspirated version and the unaspirated version in the same category. That's what makes you a native English speaker. If you're not a native English speaker, but a native English speaker of Korean, you had to learn that the aspirated P sound and the unaspirated P sound could mean the same thing. You had to actually learn that those variations were possibilities of meaning the same thing. Whereas for you as an English speaker, if you were going to learn Korean, you would have to learn to really listen and differentiate the aspirated P and the unaspirated P. Because the difference in aspiration and unaspiration can make the difference in, in actually different words. In Korean, however, they think of a voicing as uh, different allophones of the same sound. So you'll notice that P and B are very similar. The only difference is that P is voiceless and B is voiced. T and D are similar, except T is voiceless and D, and D is voiced. K and G, again, K is voiceless, G is voiced. Now we think of those as different sounds because we have those as different phonemes. But in Korean, they think of the P sound and the B sound as just different ways of pronouncing the same sound because they put those two sounds uh, as allophones of the same phoneme. So in Korean, voicing is something that they don't tend to notice because they're allophones of the same phoneme. Whereas in English, aspiration is something we don't tend to notice because aspirated and unaspirated sounds are generally allophones, or I should say always, allophones of the same phoneme in English. So just realize the way English does it is not the only way to do it. Now, as we look at these different sounds, we can see that sometimes phones appear in complementary distribution, and sometimes they appear in overlapping distribution. Complementary distributions are distributions of allophones that are predictable. That is, we know that in a particular instance, a certain allophone will appear, and in another instance, a certain allophone will, will appear, and we can predict it. Aspiration works this way in English. So in English, we know that at the beginning of syllables, in linguistic terms, we call that syllable initial. In, at the beginning of syllables, or as, as you, you've learned, at the onset of syllables, um, then we see 
aspirated stops in English. Whereas if we're in consonant clusters or not at the beginning of syllables, at the, at the coda position in a syllable, the end of a syllable, then you have the option of aspirating or not. And then there are other rules, right? So my point is that I can give you different rules and explain the different rules and say, in this setting, you use aspiration. In this setting, you don't use aspiration. That is complementary distribution. When there are rules that predict which allophone you're going to use. Now, sometimes allophones appear in overlapping distribution. That is, we look at data and we say, well, here you have an aspiration, here you don't. I can't predict what's going on. Well, what happens when we see allophones appearing in overlapping distribution, we see them appearing in the same place with no uh, way to predict them, is that we have to then determine whether or not those allophones are allophones of the same phoneme or whether those are allophones of different phonemes. That is, if we see aspirated and unaspirated sounds appearing in the same place, maybe it's just that you have free variation. That is, maybe it's just that the language allows both. For instance, with aspirated stops in English, those can appear at the ends of uh, syllables in free variation. I can say what, I can say what. Either way, whether I use the, the aspirated T or the unaspirated T, what or what, either way, we still have the T sound. So those are still allophones of T. Whereas uh, if you have certain sounds that appear in the same place, like let's say voiced and voiceless versions of similar sounds, I could have the word uh, but and I could have the word put, but and put. Now, those appear in the same place before the exact same sounds, but, put. The only difference is one is voiced, one is voiceless. But in this case, they actually are different words. Whenever you have the same sound or similar sounds appearing in the same place, but the difference in those sounds creates different words, then we say that those sounds are in contrastive distribution. That means those sounds appear in the same place, but they make it different words. So the b and the p, they both appear in the same place, but they're different words. And because they're different words, then what we have is a minimal pair. Now, minimal pairs, uh, like the one I have here on your screen, are two words that are alike in every way. Again, we don't want to focus on the spelling. We simply want to focus on the, um, the phonetics here. So we look at the phonetics of the word, and we see hat, and we see hot. Now, phonetically, those two words are identical, except for the sound in the middle, the vowel sound. We have hat, and we have hot. Now, the question is, is the a ah sound and the aw ah sound, are those two sounds allophones of the same phoneme? That is, do English speakers hear those as the same sound, or do they hear them as different sounds? Well, we know English speakers have to hear them as different sounds because English speakers say, no, hat and hot are different words. And the only thing that's different is the vowel, the a ah and the aw. Ah. And because we can say those two words are exactly the same except for one difference, then we have minimal pairs. And when those minimal pairs exist, then we are able to say with certainty that a ah and a ah do not belong to the same phoneme. They're not allophones of the same phoneme. They're not instances of the same mental category. Instead, we say a ah is a different mental category from a. Ah. Another example of this would be spot and pot. Now, these are not perfect minimal pairs. And the reason we can't find a minimal pair is because there's no instance when an unaspirated P, like this, will differentiate a word from an aspirated P, not in English. Now, in Korean, yeah, those are going to make different words. But in English, we can't find a minimal pair. So spot and pot here are not minimal pairs. They're almost minimal pairs. But they're not quite minimal pairs because we have more than one difference. We have an unaspirated and an aspirated P. That's one difference. And also spot starts with the S sound, and pot does not. So we have two differences here. But the reason I can't find a minimal pair is they don't exist. There's no instance where you would find the same word existing uh, and having the only difference be unaspirated versus aspirated sounds. So what does this mean to you? 
Well, what it means is you're going to have to go through a process of figuring out the relationships between different sounds. We're going to give you sounds and, and the, the, the phonetics of sounds as they are, and you're going to then have to figure out whether or not those sounds are allophones of the same phoneme or allophones of different phonemes and how they're related if they are. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to look at sounds and you're going to say, wait, are these sounds even similar, right? Because it's unlikely that you're going to have allophones of the same phoneme that are completely different sounds. Now, it does sometimes happen. Remember, one of the allophones of T is the voiced alveolar flap, like in water. That's a voiced sound. It's quite different from all the other allophones of T. But generally, we're going to look to see, are there any phones that are suspicious, right? Are there any sounds that have a lot in common. Maybe the only difference is one's voiced and one's not, or maybe the only difference is one's aspirated and one's not, or one's nasalized and one's not. And then once you see if they're suspicious, you have to say, do they occur in the same place? Because if they do occur in the same place, then we know they're in overlapping distribution. But if they don't ever occur in the same place, one occurs at the beginning of a word, the other at the end, one occurs at the end of a consonant cluster, the other at the end, one occurs before a high vowel, one occurs only before a low vowel, or whatever, then, then that's the case. You can say, oh no, these are in complementary distribution. We can predict which sound is going to be where. And then we just have to figure out what the rule is, which sound goes where. But then if, if you can't do that, if you can't find them occurring at the same place, then you can go, okay, well, if they're at the same place, do they change the meaning of the words? So, for instance, with our minimal pairs here, you had the hat and hot. You had the a sound and the a sound occurring in the same place. Well, So when they do occur in the same place, are they changing the meaning of the words? Because if so, then that means there's a minimal pair. And if you've got a minimal pair, then that means that the difference in those sounds is enough to create different words, which means those two sounds are not allophones of the same phoneme. Those sounds are different phonemes. They're allophones of different phonemes. So here's another way to think about what you're going to do. First of all, you're going to say, can I find minimal pairs? And if you can uh, not find any minimal pairs, then ah, they don't occur in the same place. They must be in complementary distribution. Now, if you're going to have to, if you find them in complementary distribution, then you might say, uh, okay, what's the rule? And then you'll be able to determine what the distribution is. Which sound goes where? Is it before a vowel, after a vowel, before a nasalized consonant? What is the rule? Or if you say, yeah, I have minimal pairs, then you can say, okay, do they create different meanings? So if you find a minimal pair where there's the, set, the words are exactly the same except for the, the, the sounds you're interested in, then you say, okay, are the meanings different? If the meanings are different, then fine, you have two different phonemes. If the meanings are not different, then what you have are allophones of the same phoneme, but they're in free variation. So they're in the same place, they, uh, the words mean the same thing, so therefore, it's just the case that speakers are free to choose one or the other without changing the meaning. All right, I know this has been a lot to take in and a lot to take in really quickly. So as you read through this, make sure you go ahead and take a look at some of the, uh, the problems in the back of your book. We'll start the next lecture with uh, some practice on this and actually work through a lot of these problems so that you can come to understand how this works when you're actually solving uh, phonology, phonology problems. All right. Have a great day. Thanks.